Okay, you guys ready? Everybody good? Okay. Good morning. Thank you for being here today. We're at the Phoenix Police Regional Academy where we're going to be discussing what the carotid control technique is and what it is not. I think there's been a lot of uh, misinformation out there, so we thought it was important for us to kind of address what those questions are related to it and kind of also give you an opportunity to know about what other uh, use of force options there are for us when, we, when we're dealing and taking people into custody. Officer Mike Melpass has been teaching here at the Academy. He is a subject matter expert in use of force and de-escalation, so he'll be kind of talking through what that carotid control technique is. I'm available for questions, and Mike. So Mike, talk to us about what the carotid control technique and how long it's been used by the Phoenix Police Department. The, the carotid control technique has been used by the Phoenix Police Department on and off uh, for as long as I've been here. I've been here 23 years. I've been a police officer for 28 years. Uh, it's, it's a common use technique in some law enforcement agencies and in other ones they put it at a higher level of force than uh, just someone who wants to fight with a police officer. Um, do you want me to describe what it is? Yes. The, the carotid control technique reduces oxygenated blood flow to the brain and in the process of reducing that oxygenated blood flow, it can render a person unconscious. Uh, and then that makes it easier to take a person into custody who is being combative with the police. That's the effectiveness of the technique. Help us understand what it's not, though. There's, people Absolutely. kind of get confused so between two bullets. Okay, so the carotid control technique is about pressure on the heart. Most of the time, it's about pressure on the heart. Okay, so, so most of the people who are uh, confusing it with a chokehold. So here, here's here's the difference. You choke wind. So if a if a if a choke goes against the trachea itself, you are choking the wind. If you are going against the sides of the neck and you're trying to reduce oxygenated blood flow to the head, you are not choking the person. Uh, that's the difference between the two. And even in mixed martial arts, if you watch, they call it a rear naked choke. It is technically not a choke. You choke wind. You do not choke blood. Uh, but so it's just a misnomer. It gets mis miscommunicated and a lot of people say oh he's choking him he's choking him you choke wind uh, you do not choke blood why would you use one over the other uh, it, it's, which one do you, would you use yeah. law, law enforcement recommend would recommend when it was an authorized uh, use of force going after the blood flow to the brain reducing the oxygenated blood flow when you are going after the wind you have two problems number one they can't breathe and number two you may be causing structural damage to the front of the throat or to the back of the neck depending on how you set that choke up uh, in sports there's a lot of different ways of setting up a choke uh, in the street they aren't necessarily very safe for people so we don't recommend a choke uh, unless you're a lethal force of course but uh, short of lethal force we don't recommend chokes so what do you recommend instead what, what are the tactics now that this is no longer available what, what tactics will we be training officers to use so what we will be training is what we call compassionate restraint Compassionate restraint is the idea that I could be called to a scene and be asked to take a 12-year-old with developmental disabilities into custody on behalf of a judge. I could be asked to deal with someone who's mentally ill who has not committed a crime, but a judge has handed us an order and said, I need you to deliver this person to this place. If I can't think of a way of effectively getting them into custody without treating them as if they had committed a violent crime, then we're using the same techniques across the board. Using those same techniques across the board is not effective when you're hurting people who don't need to be hurt. The idea of compassionate restraint is we want the officers to be comfortable enough that when they are in these situations where they're dealing with people who have not committed crimes, we can think of other ways of safely bringing this person into custody. At the higher end with people who do want to fight with a police officer, we have to keep the end in mind, and the end in mind is to get custody and control, and then to get advanced life support when needed for people, uh, especially people who are mentally ill or have drugs on board. It changes everything when a person has drugs in their system for how we deal with the person. So we have to take that into account when we look at issues of um, in custody deaths, excited delirium, and stuff like that. That's what compassionate restraint does. It gives us the ability to decide how compassionate we need to be at that moment, be able to ramp it up if we need to to solve the problem, but also be able to dial it back down when the problem is solved. So what, what, I mean, what is the physical meaning of the compassionate restraint? Can you show us some examples? Uh, I could show you some examples, but here's the easiest way of looking at it. You can control, uh, if you think of the human body as a tree, there are techniques where you try to attempt to control the tree through a limb, 
or you can attempt to control the tree through the trunk. If you were trying to move a small tree and you pull on a leaf, you're not gonna move the tree. The idea behind how you can safely and effectively bring someone to the ground is to change their body structure, cradle the head to make sure that the head is always covered and deliver them to the floor so that they can safely be taken into custody. We have a series of positions, a series of ground positions, and a series of control positions, and these are the positions that the officer is looking for. By understanding that the brain is very good at pattern recognition, we supply the patterns and then we supply the inputs that will allow them to get the person into a safer uh, custody experience using one of those positions. And then when you look at how people move on the ground or how grappling occurs on the ground, there's only so many ways you can move. If we identify that and can insert inputs on how to shut that movement down, we can get someone in custody faster. Part of compassionate restraint is also, we may have you on your stomach for a limited period of time in order to get you in handcuffs, but once you're in handcuffs, we're gonna get you on your side, we're gonna get you up to a seated position, and we're gonna start a medical evaluation, especially when we are concerned about mentally ill, or now any drugs on board, or potential uh, health threats. Uh, diabetes, obesity, cardiovascular disease, those are all also concerns. How much, does it, how much does it, losing the carotid techniques to the compassionate techniques? Okay, so here's what you have to think about. There's three ways of looking at the carotid. From an officer's perspective alone, from a legal perspective, and from a medical perspective. From an officer's perspective, is the carotid control technique effective? Yes, it is. It's very effective. From a legal perspective, if you're the only agency that recommends it at our level and everybody else puts it at lethal force, you may be at a point where you're like, okay, we're kind of alone and on our own island here. Now we need to now go to what's last but not least, the medical. Our concern is, and has been now for a little bit as we've been looking into it, last year in martial arts gyms around the world, three times in a healthy population, strokes occurred from uh, doing the rear naked choke. Now, doctors have always said that the rear naked choke, or as we call it, the carotid control technique, and we change the technique is different than the rear naked choke but a lot of people try to keep using that terminology uh, across the board. The lateral vascular neck restraint or the carotid control technique. When you ask an emergency room physician or a neurologist, is it safe on an unhealthy person? So now, is it safe to apply to someone who has methamphetamine, fentanyl, cocaine, heroin on board? Is it safe to apply on someone who may be having a manic episode that is mentally ill? The question is always, or the answer is always the same. It is relatively safe technique when used on a healthy population. Okay, well what about an unhealthy population? That is now what we are concerned about, and that's what also the Department of Justice is concerned about. So now you take it from one perspective, the officer's perspective, very effective technique. From the legal perspective, we are going to defend it all on our own if we want to keep it. And then from your medical perspective, there aren't any neurologists who are gonna say it's 100% effective 100% of the time. What they are gonna say is that it's relatively safe technique to use on a healthy population. Very rarely do we arrest MMA people. Very rarely do we arrest athletes who are in the street. We're dealing with people who have drugs and alcohol on board on a routine basis. Therefore, we have to now look at also the legal and the medical reasons why it may not be the most effective technique. Can you expand on who, the population of who this technique was generally used on and why now the department has suspended it? The department has been looking at the carotid control technique on a continuous basis. So at times we're like, and, and here's, here's an example. Two years ago, if you talk to a neurologist or you talk to some certain emergency medical room physicians, you were like, here's our idea. If someone is prone and we believe they may go into a manic state and we risk excited delirium, given that when you put the carotid control technique on, it decreases the heart rate and it brings the blood pressure down, isn't that possibly a more humane way of dealing with excited delirium than getting into a prolonged contact where you're having difficulty dealing with a person who is ultra excited, having an extreme fight or flight response, and is immensely strong and not feeling pain? And the thought process at the time was, in theory, but will you go on record? Well, no, but in theory, yes. So now the new theory is, yes, it can rapidly bring down heart rate and blood pressure, but if they are at 180 beats per minute and you drastically take them to 70 beats per minute, are there risks associated with that? And the answer is, yes, there are. So our point is, 
we should look for the medical community's help in this, and if they're willing to give it to us, the only tests that have been done to date are on a healthy population. We don't have a lot of research on an unhealthy population. What happens when drugs are on board, and then you apply these techniques? The only thing we have is hearsay or talking to other people. You know, you talk to an officer, and he's going to say it's an effective technique. But again, we have to look at it in all three ways, legal, medical, and from the officer perspective. Does that make sense? Out of 10 times, how many times is the person that you're dealing with on drugs, on some kind of, you know, going through some kind of psychotic disorder at that time? Would you say 8 out of 10, 9 out of 10? I couldn't give you a number. There's so many instances of it happening every single day, and a lot of times it's, uh, it's retro. You find out afterwards that they have drugs on board, or you think they have drugs on board because of the amount of uh, pain, receptor, or, uh, pain response, they're not receptive to pain, and the amount of strength you're getting. Uh, you can fight a 90-pound person who has fentanyl in their system and be amazed at how strong they can be. So I couldn't give you a number on that, and I wouldn't want to, uh, try, to uh, try to take a guess at it. Can you talk to us about five years ago we started changing the, the training into that compassionate, uh, just a different way of approaching someone who is either has mentally, uh, uh, mental uh, disabilities or children and different aspects of yeah. what that looks like. Can you, can you go into that? So when we started with our de-escalation training several years ago, part of the de-escalation training was what are the things we can control? So we looked at the three and, and what it's what, and we're not really sure where the term came from, but there's three lawful but awfuls that are the ones that people look at and they're like, well, it's considered lawful according to this, but it looks horrible. And those three were uh, shooting the drivers of moving vehicles, dealing with unarmed suspects and dealing with the mentally ill. So at that time, what we said, can we work on those three? And the answer is yes, we can. So you, you change your policies about shooting the driver of a moving vehicle. You explain to officers that a guy going 50 miles an hour behind the wheel and you kill the driver, you now have a bigger bullet moving down the street. Uh, dealing with unarmed people, mistake of fact can happen in, and a mistake of fact with uh, an unarmed person would be the person's brain makes its best guess, and that guess is they go for what would be a weapon if it were there. There's not a weapon there in the officer's head. He now believes that person is going for a weapon, and I, I, we can show you the brain science that uh, he may actually see one even if one's not there, and you get a mistake of fact shooting. So when dealing with unarmed people and the mentally ill, here's the one we can focus on. If we can reduce the time under tension, then our chances of getting this to a successful conclusion where nobody gets hurt go through the roof. If we can immediately get contact on the shallow end, instead of this becoming a four and a five minute encounter, the chances of anyone walking away without injury goes through the roof. If it takes a minute, two minutes, three minutes, four minutes, people are going to start to get hurt. So the idea is, can we reduce the time under tension and in part of reducing the time under tension is also once that person is on their stomach, we get their arms behind their back, they're not on their stomach anymore. They're going to be on their side, they're going to be up to a seated position, and we're going to start evaluating them for advanced life support. Uh, the idea behind the compassionate restraint is exactly that. Reduce the time under tension, but in order to reduce that time under tension, you need to be able to take control faster. And if you look at what some of your emergency room physicians say about excited delirium, at the point where the police have to contact this person, it is vital that they get con or uh, they get control as immediately as quickly as possible so that we can get advanced life support on board if we're going to be dealing with people who are prone to these manic states it is our goal to make sure that the time under tension is reduced as much as we possibly can did we demonstrate that already I, no, I, okay, can we, we did not demonstrate that compassion the, yeah. yeah so th this is one version so you have to keep in mind uh, it's not a technique it's a principle. So the principle is, if I can control the trunk of the tree, instead of trying to work with limbs, I have more of a chance of getting control. So a simple seat belt harness would be one arm goes over, one arm goes under, and I am going to grab control of his trunk. Once I have this control, the next thing I'm going to do is make him move a little bit because the human body, when it's in its anatomical alignment, is the strongest, most agile, mobile, and hostile he can be in that position. If I can take him out of this position, then I have a good chance of bringing him to the floor. So rule number one is to secure, and there's different ways of doing the harness. This is a seat belt harness right here. So I've secured him. I haven't pulled back, but I want his structure broken back to at least 45 degrees. Once his structure is back 45 degrees, I have a very high likelihood of being able to deliver him to the ground. 
Ideally, I would like to deliver him to a seated position. That gives me the best opportunity to then control him where I want him to go. So, seatbelt harness, I break his structure first if I can. I get this hold right here and I start to move him a little bit or I introduce a bump that now takes his hips 45 degrees up that way. His hips go 45 degrees up that way. This is coming with me. So I bump and I sit him down right here. This is the first control position on the ground. There's other variations of it, but this is the first place you're looking to get him to. A lot of officers on their off days train mixed martial arts and stuff. We recommend it, but you also have to remember that some of the takedowns that are used in mixed martial arts, you can't use those on pavement. Uh, that's incredibly dangerous for the head. So you have to think about that when, you, when we also come up with ways of bringing someone to the ground. We can't use sportive techniques. It's not that they're not effective, it's that they're too effective for what we're looking to do. If I whip Brian's head to the concrete, it's not going to be very good for his skull. So I have to figure out a way to deliver him safely, but I also have to figure out a way to keep my officers safe. So the way to do that is I would rather be here dealing with him than be up here dealing with him. Now if Brian is only suffering from mental illness or he has a developmental disability, I am responsible for how he goes to the ground. And it does me no good if I say, well, yeah, I just couldn't figure out another way to do it and he gets hurt. So we introduce that idea of, if Brian wants to get more animated and combative, we also have ways of dealing with that. But the whole goal is if I understand what position I want to take him to, I also know the next position I need to take him to to get control. That's the gist of what we're trying to teach. The brain is very good at pattern recognition. It's why you get good at athletics. What we're doing is supplying the pattern. We're giving them ideas for where the body moves on the ground and how to insert something to get control of that body and then to get off that body as quickly as possible. Can you demonstrate the difference from the compassionate and what the carotid would have looked like? So because we're not teaching it, we're not gonna okay, show it. Gonna, yeah, we're not gonna show it. I think for us, it's it's one of those moments. And, and Mike and I had a conversation yesterday. I think for us, it was just a great opportunity to really talk about the force that is available to officers, not just obviously the carotid. Um, I think our goal is always to make sure that we are applying handcuffs as quickly and as safely as possible. Obviously, keep in mind the officer safety and the person who's going to be going to jail um, or getting medical assistance if, if it's somebody who's trying to harm themselves. Um, but that was this, that was the opportunity for today. Do you guys have any other quick questions? Mike, Mike has to go teach. <laughs> Could you to demonstrate it one more time um, aside from the mic stand? Yeah, absolutely. Like, so how do you want that out the Yeah, way. absolutely. Well, just toward us. So we're just the compassionate technique. Yeah, yeah. perfect. Just you're going to be doing. Yeah. Now, yeah. keep in mind that it's very easy to demonstrate on a voluntary person. Brian's being voluntary, he's being completely compliant. Mm -hmm. If it, it, it changes a little bit, it's going to be a little bit more dynamic. It's going to look more dynamic if he starts to resist. But the whole goal here is if the person isn't resisting, but is not letting you cuff them or transport them, you may still have to deliver them to the ground. So keep in mind that this is just a setup. Brian isn't given any resistance. So this is the harness, and this is one version of it. There's a lot of versions of it. <clears throat> but again, I want to get his hips up 45 degrees away, because as if hips go this way and I'm pulling 45 this way, his structure is going to come with me. I support the structure, I'm supporting the head, the head is not going to bang against the floor, that's the gist of the technique. So I'm here and I pull in, my hips are going to go up, and I bump him straight to the floor. Nothing changes if he actually resists, the only difference is you have to work a little bit harder in order to get that break in the initial structure in order to put him on the floor, but the principles are still exactly the same. And if we understand those principles, then an officer understands when the person becomes more aggressive, the, the principles are still exactly the same. You getting your own fight or flight up because someone else starts to resist a little bit isn't going to make things easier for you. It's going to make it harder. So we want to give them that confidence that that person starting to resist, it's not that big of a deal. We can still deal with it as long as we keep the end in mind and we know what to insert along the way. That's it. Sure. Any other questions? Why is it so important that you're suspending it right now and um, how will this help your job and maybe pose challenges? Sorry. Uh, so I think the biggest question that we've gotten so far is why now? And, I, and like Mike talked about, it's a continuous evaluation of processes throughout the country. So this one was the opportunity to take a look at and reassess it. Uh, policies are meant to be looked at and changed if it's not working for us. And so that's what we're doing now. Anything else? All right. Thank you guys very much. Thank you. Thank you.